everybody, I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to the History of the Dice Tower. This is the third part in our series, and we're actually going to get to the Dice Tower this time. At this point, though, as I'm going through all this stuff, I realize this can be more than a four-part series, so we'll see how many times it takes. But last time I talked about from college all the way to I went to Korea, and in Korea, some of the board games that I started playing there and finding these designer board games with my two good friends, Sam Healy and Joe Stedman. So one of the games I played, Settlers of Canaan, uh, I, it was very similar to Settlers of Catan, and at the time I thought, huh, no one has written a review on this online, so I'll write a review of it. I saw other people writing reviews, and I thought, well, some people write reviews, and this seems like a, a way that I could help other people learn about these games. So I wrote a review August 10th, 2002. Well, that was pretty much all I thought about that, but somewhere along the line, someone saw that review, and they sent me an, an idea where they had, and I've since met this person a few years ago, where they were going to send out a group of games to different people. Like, you get a few games, and then they said, everyone in your group will need to play the game and write little reviews and put them online. I said, that sounds cool. I, I, I wouldn't mind seeing some more games. So the first one I got was Pig Pile. Uh, we got, a, we got a, group, a little pile of games, Pig Pile, and that was the next review I wrote, both, mostly because... That was what I said I would do if we got it. We enjoyed it. It was a light game. It was a fun little game. We were getting all these other games, and I said, whew. But the next game blew us away, and that was Time's Up. This party game I thought was fantastic. I wrote an extremely glowing review of it. Really enjoyed that game, and still do to this day. And then I thought, well, these review things, that's kind of fun. I didn't think much more about it, and it wasn't until a year later. And I got a game, Duel of Ages, which at that point became my favorite game and was my favorite game for a while and is still one of my favorite games. And this game was so fun and so interesting and I was so full of excitement, I had to tell people how much I like this game. So I went online and I typed up a review of this and the response was pretty good. I mean, looking back, it wasn't that big of a response, maybe seven or eight comments, and several thumbs up, but people were like, woohoo, good review, we like your reviews. And I thought, huh, well, I like that people liked what I did. This is something I could do more, more of, I think. Because in Korea, I was always looking for some sort of hobby and things to do during my downtime. Because of the way my teaching schedule was, I'd teach and have some time off, and then teach and have some time off. And there were all these little gaps, and I thought, oh, I'll type up some board game reviews. And whenever I start doing something, I tend to really kind of put a lot of effort into it. So uh, I started typing up a lot of reviews. And I wrote reviews for a while, and later on, and this is over a year after I did my first uh, review, I got an email from someone who said, I will send you a copy of my game if you review it. Well, that had never even occurred to me. I mean, that originally had happened, but I thought that was kind of a weird promotional thing, and I never heard from those people again. So I said, sure, the game was Time Control. Now, Time Control I it was my first review copy, and it was a negative review. It's a game about going back and forth in time, had some really cool concepts, but it was just a bad game. Now, at this point in time, I was getting more heavily involved in the board gaming scene. I met some people uh, from Korea, uh, Shin Yu and Jaewon, and they taught me Citadels, which blew my mind, and we played all these fun games, Age of Steam, and I started bringing these games here. Met my good friend Bob Arhus, who came to Korea, and we had a good time and started. I was doing review after review, and I was getting this reputation of being Mr. Positive, you know, an, op an optimist who always gave games good reviews. Yeah, everything's good, which wasn't quite true. And again, I like to point out that my first review copy was negative. But I still thought it was a cool idea. I thought, do companies send you games? Well, this might be an interesting way to try out some new games. So I emailed a few companies, and one company president gave me a call. I remember I got a call in Korea from Eric Haudemont from uh, Days of Wonder, which at the time was a very, very small company. And uh, Queen's Necklace was the game I had wanted to review, and he talked to me and sent it to me. And then eventually, and uh, later on and in the following year, came over to Korea and visited Korea and uh, had a chance to show me Ticket to Ride because he had picked it up from the, the publisher, the manufacturer in China. And my getting this review Ticket to Ride before anybody else was a huge scoop back in those days. There was a lot of reviewers around. Greg Schlosser was probably the most well-known reviewer. But getting these some of these games and getting that relationship was a really big deal. And as time went by, people started to know that I reviewed a lot of games. 
Um, Origins Game Fair in 2003 was the first time I had an opportunity to go to any game convention, really. And it was an exciting time for me, and I'm still very fortunate that it worked out that I was able to go, and I had a great time. I went there. A few people knew of my reviews. I was able to meet people and play games, and that was a really good time. And I th was so enamored with the idea of conventions, and I had read about Alan Moon's Gathering of Friends that I decided to start my own convention. Now this has like completely gone out of my mind. I'm only telling you this because I've gone back and read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails, and I'm reading these emails of me saying, I want to start a game convention, give me tips and things. Well, obviously that kind of fizzled out. We never did that. But I was like, oh, what else? What are different things I can do besides writing reviews? Reviews are good, but what are other things I can do? So I found a gentleman named Jeremy Avery. I don't know where he is today. I, he seemed to drop out of gaming a few years after this, but we decided to start a series of back and forth. And I kind of credit this. This is one of those times at the beginning, I said, you know, a single voice is good in reviews, but it's always good to have multiple voices. This is something you'll see that we do even today. I love that this back and forth. And so we did this back and forth series called Musings On. I think you can find them, maybe some of them on Board Game Geek even now, where we would talk back and forth. In fact, one of the first ones was St. Petersburg, where I was the negative one, even though St. Petersburg is a game I like quite a bit today. But it was just, it, this was a lot of fun, and I had fun putting that together. I also started interviewing people at this point in time. I call it Interviews with an Optimist. I decided to spin off this whole Tom Vassell's Always Positive vibe and just start interviewing different people in the industry. Now, this was useful for two reasons. One, it gave me a lot of insight to the industry. Remember, uh, when you jump into the industry like this and you learn these things, you learn them slowly. Sometimes I listen to people today and they talk about the industry and I'm thinking, well, you don't really understand all that stuff yet. But that's because you learn this and talking to all these different people uh, was fantastic. I did over a hundred of these, but it also gave me a lot of connections and a lot of people that I was able to meet and learn from. And in all this, so all this is going on, uh, one of the people I met online was Rick Thornquist. Rick Thornquist is very important and trivial to the formation of the Dice Tower. He was working with a website, GameFest. They were a board game uh, website that sold board games. They're since out of business. And they wanted to have regular columns, a column every day from different people, like a blog, like a blog every day. And so Rick contacted me, and I was like, sure. I would love to jump into this and write a blog every day or once a week on a certain day. So I started doing that and started forming a relationship with Rick. Now around the same time, I was consuming board game stuff as much as I could, reading reviews, doing this. And then I found out there was audio. Uh, Dirk Solko and all, uh, Scott Alden from Board Game Geek started a podcast called Geek Speak. And this was a podcast with just them two talking, and then they started interviewing different people, and I found this fascinating. In fact, like uh, one of their episodes, I think like the 11th or 12th episode, they interviewed me, which was great. I called in from Korea. I was so excited to be able to talk to these guys. And just for me, writing was good, but I loved, loved talking. And so that was a lot of fun for me. And then another gentleman, Mark Johnson, Board Games To Go, he started a podcast. And as he did this podcast, he said something to the effect of, anybody can do this. You know, why don't you try it? Give it a try. The world's wide open. And I thought, wow, this podcasting thing sounds interesting. I think we can do it. I was in my church and I was helping run the sound system. We had a small church, but a pretty nice sound system in the back with microphones. And me and Joe Stedman were like sitting there one day and we were thinking, we have all this audio equipment. Pastor says we can use it anytime we want. Podcasting sounds fun. I said, Joe, do you want to help me start a podcast? And he was like, sure. So we started our podcast at this point in time. And I went to Rick Thornquist on GameWire and GameFest, and I said, would you be interested in us putting up a show? Me and Joe recorded a show. We called it the Tom and Joe Show. I said it to Rick. I said, I need somewhere to host a show. Would you be willing to host us at GameWire? And he said, sure. So May 5th. 2005. That was the first um, episode of what became the Dice Tower. In fact, our first episode was recorded in uh, was .rm, <laughs> um, which Rick Thornquist said 
why don't you try the format MP3? And I was like, all right, I guess so, it doesn't matter. And for a while, I think we were recording it in three formats uh, until eventually we just stopped recording the other formats and did uh, MP3. And so the second episode of this, when I sent it to Rick, I, we called it Panzers and Pieces because me and Joe were trying to come up with some name and Joe was trying to go with his shtick of, hey, well, I'm a war gamer and Tom's a Euro gamer, which today would make people uh, fall over and be like, what? Tom's called a Euro gamer? Hello, this is Tom Vassell. I'm Joe Stedman. Welcome to Panzers and Pieces. Yes, Panzers and Pieces. That's our, this is our second episode and the first with this new name that we made up after soliciting many ideas from other people. I'm not really sure if we like it yet or not. I don't know. Let's get some get some feedback about yeah, it. Yeah, tell us what you think of it. The Panzer stands for airplanes, I think. <laughs> yeah, right. And pieces sounds it stands for Tom, you know. Yes, Joe wanted to originally had dice, but we I, I wanted to take dice out because I thought there's so many Euro games that don't have dice in them. In yeah, fact, many of them, but most yeah, of them don't. And, you know, every war game has a Panzer in it, so... <laughs> well, okay, but Panzers make people think of war games. I, I like tanks and dice. Uh, we did this, and we called it Panzers and Pieces, and Rick sent me an email, and he said, Listen, I never like to ask contributors this, but can you change the name? Panzers just doesn't work very well. It's not very war gamey, the podcast anyway. Uh, German people might be not pleased with it. It might give the wrong impressions. And I said, all right, all right, we'll come up with another name. And for some reason, I came up with the name The Dice Tower for episode three, and it's stuck ever since. I was really happy with that. So we started putting this show together. We started posting it. So now I was doing written board game reviews, interviews with an optimist, um, doing this back and forth with uh, Jeremy Avery, and now starting this show with Joe that we started doing a week at a time, a weekly podcast, and we had a lot of fun doing it. Horrible <laughs> quality. We really didn't know what we were doing, but all I knew is I wanted the show to have different sections, and I wanted it to end with a top 10 list for whatever reason. Uh, top 10 list started in 2005, and here, 13 years later, we're still doing top 10 lists. So this week, we're going to do our top 10 card games. We'll start with Joe. We'll start from our 10th game and go to our top game of card games. What's our definition of a card game? For me, it was any game that was composed mostly of cards. If you think it doesn't belong, too bad. We are the <laughs> it's ones. our show. You start your own show, and yeah. then you can say what you we're want. We're picking the category. All right, we're here having our own show. Now, at this point in time, I was trying to figure out what to do with the show, and Board Game Geek actually approached me and was wanting to know if we wanted to come on board. Now, you got to realize at this point in time, Board Game Geek was run by two people, Scott Alden and, and Dirk Solko. And had Board Game Geek been solely run by Scott Alden, I think we might be part of Board Game Geek today, actually. Who knows? But Dirk was just the method of him communicating. He was basically like, hey, you want to come on? Uh, well, you know, you, well, you, you, you really should be on our show. That kind of attitude. I was like, no, you know what? I don't think everything should be in one website. So we're going to go over here with GameWire because GameWire had game news and blogs. And I thought it's good to have these two different sites on the internet. And so we did all this and I went to Origins again in 2005. And it was unbelievable. Every publisher I talked to knew who I was. Publishers were giving me games. I came home with like 20 games. I was like, wow, so many games. <laughs> and I, was, I, wrote, I remember I wrote Laura. I said, Laura, I'm famous. I didn't even know it. I'm not famous. But it was just so exciting to me for that to happen. And I became a celebrity and signed things it, uh, for, for people. And I was like, this is kind of weird and stuff. But I loved being so involved in the gaming community. At this point, Steve DeCellis, I need to give him a shout out, helped me put together a website, the first Dice Tower website, which was not great, was not fantastic. We have since overhauled it twice, um, but I had a website and now I could send people to that. And then Rick said to me, hey, Game Fest is going out of business. What are we going to do? And I was like, oh man, Rick's the one who's hosting our episodes. How is this going to continue on? What are we going to do next? And so we debated back and forth. Rick thought about going with uh, Fun Again Games or with other boards and bits, I believe, different board game store companies. And even Board Game Geek was interested in having this g game uh uh, the game wire, which Rick was doing news, he was doing previews of Essen and stuff, come underneath them. But Rick finally decided, after a lot talking to all the different contributors and stuff, he decided to just go independent. And so he started his own website, boardgamenews.com. 
And so we all went with him. That's where the Dice Tower went, and we all joined him. And so a new website was born, which for a while was a pretty big website. You went to Board Game Geek, and you went to Board Game News for your news, for sure. At this point in time, I also got an email. This was later on in 2005 from Edwin in Malaysia asking me to come be a special guest. I almost deleted the email because I thought it was a joke. Like, oh yes, I'm sure. We want you to come to our thing in Malaysia, sure, as a special guest for a board game convention. And I was like, wait, that's a little specific. And I emailed said, are you sure? He said, yes. They paid for my ticket. I went in, I said, what do you guys want me to talk about? They said, well, you know, we want you to talk about something, I don't even remember what one of the topics was, something gaming, and we'd like you to do your top 100 games of all time. I said, 100 games? Can I even put together 100 games? I think I can. So on the airplane flight, the long airplane flight, I sat there and I wrote down all the different games I liked playing and put them around and moved them around in order. I got there and I said, all right, we're going to go through my top 100 games. What games do you have in your library? Let's pull them out. And I started doing it and I'll never forget that moment. I stood up, there was maybe 50, 60 people there. It was in this huge mall in the middle of KL, Malaysia. Uh, fantastic mall. And I was there, people were walking by, there's a little crowd there and I was like, number 100 this. And I think number 98 was Puerto Rico. And I said, number 98, Puerto Rico. And people cheered because they were happy that I didn't have it as number one. And I was like, wow. This is fun talking to people like this. This is great. And it was so much fun. I remember playing Descent there for the first time and had a great time. I'd never been a special guest at a convention before. And I can have fun gaming no matter what. But that was a unique experience for me for the first time. And I said, wow, I have no idea where the Dice Tower is going to go next. I hadn't expected it to go anywhere. I just expected it to be me and Joe kind of doing it as a fun thing. But because of my reviews... And because I was doing all this other stuff, I kind of was, and also I was really the main host of the Dice Tower. Me and Joe did things, and Joe said, let's, you know, either one of us can veto each other on a decision. Well, that doesn't really work for the Dice Tower. So as time went by, Joe helped me, but he was also preparing to leave Korea eventually. And I thought, well, what am I going to do when that happens? Well, I'll tell you what happens next time. See you in part four tomorrow. Until then, I'm Tom Bass, and this has been the history of the Dice Tower.